Hi, good afternoon, everybody. So the lunchtime lull has worn off and everybody's attention has perked back up? Okay. Now, I, I'm, again, out of personal curiosity, I asked this during our first session and I was very surprised by the answer. How, for how many people here, this is your first OpenStack Summit? Wow, okay, I'm constantly surprised by the response. Well, welcome, I hope you're having a great week. Uh, this is the second of four Cisco sessions that we have in our room today. This one is on the Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Manager, we call it CVIM. Um, uh, Chandra Ganguly is gonna start off, one of our engineering directors. I will let him introduce the rest of the speakers when he's all set. And we will build some time in for some Q&A at the end, about 10 minutes. And Thank you, Gary. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chandra Ganguly. I'm the Director for Platform Engineering for Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Manager. Uh, with me today on the stage is Ajay Kalambur and Nilima. Uh, Ajay is the Principal Engineer for CVIM, and Nilima is the, one of the Principal Engineers for Cisco Container Platform. Uh, this talk is a multi-part talk. This is talk one of two. Uh, of subsequent to this talk, there will be another talk where we'll talk about how we have taken CVIM and got an, an adapted Ironic and essentially uh, you know, cont running container workloads on it. So this is really a you know, multi-part talk, if you will. Um, so in terms of the agenda, what we'll talk about is we'll give you a high-level um, platform overview of what Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Manager is. Um, and then we will talk about how we have evolved this platform across multiple dimensions, be it the hardware, be it the software, be it workloads, be it networking. Um, subsequent to that, we will talk about uh, us, uh, another platform of Cisco called CCP, Cisco Container Platform, we'll give you an overview of that. And then how we have, uh, how CVIM has, has, is using CCP as an application. Uh, so as a, as a result, we can evolve this platform to not only host workloads that are running in VM, but also in containers and bare metals. That's basically how we'll go through. And we'll conclude this talk with a demo and a summary of where we are today and what we are, where we are going uh, in the future. Um, so at a high level, um, if you look at it, uh, typically today, uh, why, again, why did we even do CVIM or Cisco Virtual Infrastructure Platform? The, uh, when we evolved on the, in this journey about three years back, what we found is customers were, were essentially uh, doing a lot of, uh, lot of this cloud uh, deployment on their own, DIY. And while it was taking them, let's say, anywhere from a week to two weeks to get it going, the problem was how do you do day in operations, not just get it, somehow hook or crook, get it going. Uh, and they were having a lot of problems when when there is a security update, there was a, you know, uh, there is a, some one, one piece of the compute node or the, or the controllers went bad, you wanted to add more storage node. Those problems were not thought through. So then the other option was people went through what is called the system integrator, which is uh, basically take the best of breed from multiple different components and bring it together. Well, that kind of works, but what happens again is many of those are, are done through contracts, service contracts. As a result, the, the service integrator does it once, but how do you replicate it in 20 sites, 30 sites? That becomes a challenge. How do you scale this? Um, and, and, and in the lack of, many, many cases in the lack of automation, um, it becomes like a snowflake. For every, every site has, a, has slight different variations of what you have. So what we decided is, you know, that these are the two problem statements on the basis of which CVIM, uh, you know, was architected and even envisioned that you would like to have a fully automated and true automation, meaning one, for any, any command or any operation, so one click, one button, one CLI approach with a REST API front end, which will not only do the basic install of the cloud on day zero, but lifecycle manage it across and releases, and software updates, and security, um, uh, security updates, and whatnot. Um, while we are doing that, also the cloud today, uh, or initially started with a very Cisco-centric hardware. It has, I will see as, as we go through this presentation, how it has evolved to handle uh, third-party computes, or third-party 
uh, complete infrastructure, how it has evolved through switches and, so and, and storage, storage and networking as well. So that was the, at a high level uh, what, what our ambition was uh, three years back when we started this. Um, one thing we, we also made sure that we do not deviate from the Etsy model. So we have a very, very clear demarcation of where the cloud CVM infrastructure work stops and expose all the OpenStack APIs you know, consistently so that if you are running in an OpenStack cloud somewhere else, you bring your workload on the CVM, not, you shouldn't have to change anything if the automation is done using the OpenStack APIs. And what we have seen over the last three years actually is uh, as customers have brought in third-party VNFs, uh, this is not just Cisco VNF, just third-party VNFs. My only question to most of them has been, is there, has this worked in OpenStack before? What scale parameters did you use? What is the scale at which you ran it? Did you need any tweaking of the OpenStack parameters? Because we know many of the times the VNFs are not truly cloudified yet. And, and those are the, as long as we do know of those, and the, we can, we can through a feature option or optional feature, we can actually adapt the cloud to that. We have seen its work all the time. So given the fact that uh, essentially, uh, so that's basically what we have uh, what, at a high level where we are. How did we achieve it? We achieved it, one of the things we are very, we are in partnership with Red Hat in terms of the open source, open stack and the kernel bits. We do take the repos from Red Hat on a monthly sync app, we do that. And then we have our own automation yeah, through an Ansible, uh, Ansible Python-based automation that we deploy this entire cloud. Ajay will talk in the next, uh, in the next few slides on uh, uh, slightly more details of our architecture. And there you will see why this has worked elegantly for us. Um, but the key is the, whatever is marked in green is essentially what CVIM, uh, the scope of CVIM is. It, there's a REST API in front where through which you essentially can manage multiple instances of the cloud from the same UI interface. Also, you can write your own API, you know, own, um, uh, own, own, own uh, data pool or own, own, own client to control those APIs and manage the cloud. Where yeah, it's up to you. Uh, essentially, everything comes to the REST API. Yeah. So I'll hand, hand over uh, the next few slides to Ajay, who will talk about the architecture of this CVM, uh, you know, cloud or infrastructure. Thanks, Chandra. So um, given the fact that uh, we saw a high-level picture of um, what Cisco VIM does, it, at a fundamental level, it deploys OpenStack and manages the lifecycle of the OpenStack cloud. But how did we do that? How did we deploy OpenStack? So we started, um, Cisco VIM has been around for about three years. So this project started in about 2015. And at that point, we had to make a critical choice of how do we run the OpenStack control plane. And we took a gamble because three years back, it was not common to run OpenStack control plane in containers. Uh, we started at just about the same type as an upstream project called Cola, and we kind of went um, similar time frame, right? So uh, one of the things we do is the entire control plane of OpenStack has been containerized in our case, and, as, and we have learned from three years of experience of caveats of running OpenStack in containers. There are lots of things that are at play when OpenStack services run in containers that you won't see when they run in hosts. For instance, SE Linux, container permissions, uh, exposure to the host volumes, all those kinds of things, router namespaces, network namespaces, very differently when you run it as process versus container. But what does container gives us, right? The one thing that we can do is that we can update the cloud seamlessly, right, with minimum downtime. And when there is no DB schema change, as in, let's say you're ta talking about a particular release of OpenStack like Queens, when you have minor bug fixes, there is not going to normally be a database schema change. We do allow rollback. So if your update happens and your update fails, there will be an automatic rollback and all the services will be restored to where they started from. So that's useful to have. We don't support, uh, support rollback in major version upgrades. So if you look at our design, it's very simple. We have everything running in containers including the entire OpenStack control plane and also the Ceph services like Ceph Mon, Ceph Manager, and so on. We have a simply, simple HA design where HA proxy is running in active, active, active for all services with the exception of Galera, which is better run in an active backup. If you look at the bottom portion of this slide, this is the various steps that the installer actually goes through in terms of um, standing up an OpenStack cloud. So you start with 
we'll look in more detail in the next slide, you start with bringing in all the packages that you need. So one thing that this installer supports is it's a some complete air-gapped install, which means technically you need no access to the internet to do the installation. So you could, you could basically do this installation completely offline. The first step is an input validation. Any installer needs input, right? You need to tell it what are your ba bare metal nodes available, what is this um, IMC information into those bare metal nodes and so on. So the first step we do is we validate that all your input is sane and if, you, if it's not sane, we fail right away. So that way you don't have to learn much later in the installer that something is wrong. Then we do a bare metal install. Uh, we do it for Cisco servers, UCSB series, C series, third party servers. Um, there are few third party platforms that we support right now and that list is growing. Then uh, there is node level setup. It's not just about, in addition to maintaining OpenStack, you also need to make sure that there are kernel, each, each, each particular node has host packages, kernel is updated, things like NTP are configured, so those base things, common node level setup is done. Storage is set up, so we have, um, you can either run, uh, Chandra will talk a, a little bit about it, you can run storage co-hosted with compute nodes, controllers, or you could run dedicated storage nodes, so we support all those kinds of configuration. Then the OpenStack service orchestration happens, that can also include an ironic bare metal install. Uh, Abhishek will talk about it in the next presentation. And then we have an optional CCP install, which is you can now stand up a cloud which not just supports virtual machine workloads and bare metal workloads through ironic, but can also support container workloads through Cisco Container Platform. And Nilima will talk about it in a little bit detail. And final is a complete self-test, which is we run throughput tests, VM launch tests, everything at the end of the install to make sure that everything works successfully. So moving on, um, so this is what I talked about in terms of you have two modes of doing the install. The first mode is what is called a connected install, which means you have access to the internet. So in addition to the nodes that you need, uh, we ask for an extra management node, which is from where the installation actually happens. In future, this will be uh, in, in HA. So you can either do a disconnected install, in which case you basically download all the artifacts into USB, plug it into the, um, into the management node and then begin the installation. So what then happens is the first step is we stand up a Docker registry on the management node. Remember that all our services are run as containers. So this Docker registry is from where the controllers, the compute nodes and, the, uh, and all the other nodes will basically pull the Docker containers from and do the installation. So this is an example of how we do an air-gapped install, completely air-gapped install and you could either operate in connected mode or uh, disconnected mode. So moving back, Chandra will now talk a little bit about the different plat uh, evolution of Cisco Web and the different platforms. Thank you, Ajay. Um, so Ajay has kind of also already alluded how we have evolved this platform to handle software updates and upgrades, but that's not the only dimension in which it has evolved. Um, our customers actually have, have kind of demanded and asked for, um, for uh, evolution of the, of the platform across footprints. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide what that means. Uh, hardware support, we started with Cisco UCS, CCDs and BCDs. We moved into HP third-party compute and then now we are going to a pure NFV as a software and have, uh, uh, you know, getting into uh, support for Quanta late, uh, early part of next year as, as a, as a, as a third-party uh, cloud uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have also evolved our networking uh, to go from OVS to VPP, obviously SRIV and uh, include a, including both ACI and VTS as the SDN controller. Um, obviously there's ML2 plugin included as part of the offering too. Um, in, in terms of storage, where we have evolved is we started again with Ceph. The Ceph itself has evolved into single backend and multi backend because we have our customers who needs high IOPS. So we have SSD based Ceph or hard drive based Ceph in the same cloud. So when you, when you host a VM, you basically can attach to right, right backend infrastructure. Uh, we also support now at NetApp um, and Solid, uh, SolidFire and SwiftStack. All of that is now part of the offering. You have to decide on, on days, you know, which way you want to go. Based on your requirements, we can go that way. Uh, today, our second part of the talk, will focus on how we have evolved the workload support uh, from VM to containers and then also bare metal, and you'll see that. In terms of the hardware footprint, uh, again, we started with a full-on, where you have dedicated controller, computes, and Ceph nodes. A uh, lot of our customers are the service providers. They have come back and said, you know what? 
yeah, dedicated Ceph nodes is good. But you know, my, my workload doesn't need a lot of Ceph storage. So I'm burning a lot more real hardware um, rather than, given the amount of uh, hardware I'm using co compared to what I'm using it for. So then came in the evolution, what is called hyper-converged nodes, where some of these nodes can actually act as both storage and computes. But that wasn't good enough for many of our customers because you'll see a um, lot of other customers wants to push this cloud to the edge. And today, as you know, edge means real computes at the end. We are still evolving to that point. So what we had to do in between is called, called a micropod, where now you can take three, three, no, three servers, make them act as both control compute and storage nodes. And then as your compute capacity increases, you can just go ahead and add more, uh, more computes to that. Obviously, the, in, the, in, that, uh, in that solution, the storage is limited to the first three nodes. So not only um, did, we, um, did we evolve just from the footprint point of view, we've also evolved a bit, you know, on, on, on the Cisco, on the hard, hardware that we, have, we support. So initially, very early on, we start, started with Cisco, all, all Cisco UCSC or B series. But then, um, obviously, third party VNF started showing up, which was, which was not a big deal, really, from our point of view, because the, as long as they were adhering to the OpenStack APIs. But then there were customers who had enough other third-party computes and they wanted to reuse them for, for the cloud. So we basically said, okay, the control plane still is Cisco, the data plane or the computes can be third-party. That's something we supported. And now very soon, um, we are actually supporting a full third-party infrastructure on which NFVI will run. Uh, throughout this, all this evolution, also the, uh, the NIC cards have changed from, have evolved from just Cisco VIC to Intel NIC. And that evolution has also happened. Um, be one of the, one of the uh, core part of this talk uh, is essentially what is called the evolution of the workload. So again, we started with VMs, um, which is standard. Um, today, Nilima is going to talk about how we have taken this platform and, and added container support on that. So this is uh, so using CCP as an application into that. Abhishek's talk subsequently will talk about how we are taking this and also supporting Ironic, which on which you can now can run containers as well. So with that, um, uh, one, one use case that, is, uh, that I would talk, like to talk about before I hand it over to Nilima is, this, is here uh, in, which is, put, uh, very, um, uh, which is put in into this region is Dash Telecom. Dash Telecom has taken the Cisco Vim infrastructure platform and actually have deployed it in production from order to deployment in less than three months on their, what they call is their edge program. Don't get confused with the edge technology with the edge program of Dosh Telecom. Here they're talking about, they've taken the cloud, full on cloud, put it at the, as almost on the boundary of the premises of, of their uh, zone of control. And they are essentially running uh, uh, voice traffic on that with very low latencies. And um, um, so it's pretty relevant to, to this region, and we are continuing to work with them for, for expanding these clouds from four to N. And they're working with, they have, you know, there are few more requirements that are coming through, and work, we are working with, with them on evolution of the cloud and the platform. Um, with that, I will hand over the baton to Nilima. She will talk about Cisco Container Platform. Thanks, Chandra. Good afternoon, everyone. So what is Cisco Container Platform? It is a turnkey solution for deploying production-grade container clusters. We deploy 100% upstream native Kubernetes. The Kubernetes ecosystem itself is very large, and there are lots of options for anything that you want to do. Cisco Container Platform provides a curated full stack with everything from logging, monitoring, uh, you, we have a built-in Docker registry. Everything is tested and supported by Cisco. We also have the platform optimized for hybrid cloud applications. We have a partnership with uh, GKE and Google, and we, we have an architecture where you can run applications spread across GKE and your on-prem cluster. 
Last week, we announced uh, our uh, latest offering of uh, CCP, which allows you to manage your EKS clusters from your on-prem CCP dashboard. So you can deploy your local clusters and uh, clusters on EKS, and then spread your ac applications across and access resources across the two clusters. Uh, it in provides integrated networking and storage options. CCP runs today on Hyperflex, vSphere environments, AWS, and today we are going to show a demo of it running on CVIM. So for all of these environments, we have options for different, multiple options for CNI plugins as well as uh, storage provisioners. We provide a flexible deployment model. We support VM deployments across multiple infrastructures. We are also going to support uh, bare metal very soon. Uh, Abhishek will be talking about it in the next talk. So what are the features that uh, Cisco Container Platform provides? We start with being able to deploy multiple clusters on any infrastructure that you choose. We also do the complete lifecycle management of these clusters. Everything starting from giving you the OS image to provision your uh, virtual machines or bare metal nodes, to upgrading the OS, applying any patches that are required, installing Kubernetes, upgrading o Kubernetes, installing the add-on services on top of Kubernetes and upgrading them, as well as doing um, any kind of repair operation. So if your one, one of the physical hosts go do goes down, we automatically detect that and start up a new node in a different location. So all, the complete life cycle is managed by CCP. We also integrate with Active Directory and AWS IAM. So if you have an application that is running on-prem as well as in, in AWS, both of them can use the same IAM. We are looking at integrating with Keystone for the CVM integration. That's a future roadmap item not yet completed. Um, so. Um, we're going to look at the integration of CCP with CVIM. Ajay will uh, first give us an overview, and then we'll go into the deep dive of the architecture. Thanks, Dilema. So remember that we talked about a single cloud, which can basically uh, support both virtual machine workloads and container workloads. So how do you go about implementing such a cloud? So assume that you have an OpenStack cloud app, which is Cisco VIM. Now what we do is CCP is basically, um, like uh, Nilima explained, it is basically Kubernetes orchestration as a service. So what we have here is the CCP control plane is, is basically installed on a common OpenStack tenant. So the CCP control plane, which consists of a bunch of virtual machines, is installed on the common OpenStack tenant. And then the CCP API is exposed through, through like a floating IP of OpenStack. At this point, you can invoke that CCP API to create one to N clusters in OpenStack. You can create as many op uh, Kubernetes clusters in OpenStack, and you can create them at this point of time, we are supporting virtual machines. In future, we will be supporting, installing these on ironic bare metal nodes. So as you can see here, when you install Kubernetes in OpenStack, we basically have integration with the OpenStack cloud provider. So you, we use Cinder for persistent storage. We, at this point, the authentication is done through Keystone V3. The reason being, this is being supported from Queens and there's no, no support for Keystone V2, so we are pretty much doing Keystone V3. And exposing of all your Kubernetes services is, at this point, done through Neutron LBAS. We will be um, exploring something called the Octavia Ingress Controller in future. So uh, with this integration done, now you have a single cloud which can support both virtual machine workloads and container workloads. And now Nilima will talk a little bit more about how this is done and also the demo of how this whole thing plays together. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. So um, how many of you here are familiar with Kubernetes architecture? Okay. So let's have a brief overview of it so that we level set. At a high level, these are the primary components of Kubernetes. You have one or more master nodes and you have worker nodes on which you run your workloads. The three primary components of any uh, Kubernetes master are the Kubernetes API server, controller manager, and scheduler. When you create a resource in Kubernetes, whether you do it from the CLI using kubectl or you go to Kubernetes dashboard or you use the Kubernetes API, you're talking to the Kubernetes API server. So you can say, uh, create a replica set with three pods. 
Kubernetes API server takes that request and stores it as a key value pair in the NetCD data store. Once it is stored, it is up to the controller manager, the appropriate controller for, the, in, for that object that you have specified. So for a replica set, there will be a replica set controller, which is invoked by the controller manager, which comes and says, okay, there is this object that's been created by the API server, but does that exist? Are there the three pods running? No, so let me go ahead and create those pods. So the management of the object itself is done by the controller that is running in the controller manager. And once these objects are created, they need to actually be scheduled somewhere, and the Kubernetes scheduler takes upon the task of scheduling them on one of the worker nodes or the master nodes, depending on the requirements that you've specified. So all of these components in uh, Kubernetes are extensible. Everything uh, can be uh, added on to. For example, if you have a new type that you want to define, and Kubernetes does not know about this type, you can define it as a custom resource definition. Once you define a custom resource, Kubernetes now can start consuming objects of that type. You can go ahead and say kubectl create that type. And so it takes it, stores, in the, in, stores it in etcd, but what do you do with it? So you can also create a custom controller where you can say when I see this object this of new type or even an existing type, I want to do this new behavior. So this pattern of defining a custom resource and a custom controller together is called the operator model within the Kubernetes. So, we are going to show uh, uh, the demo of CCP running as an operator. This is an example of how you would define a custom resource. So you can say that, okay, this is the API version for, for our custom resource named an, as an OpenStack cluster. And once you define it and give it to Kubernetes, you can see it listed at the bottom as, as a new custom resource that has been defined. Then you can go and say, okay, that's the custom resource definition, and now instantiate it. So you create a new object where you say, create me a new cluster with three masters and two workers and a bunch of other information, what network to use, uh, where do you want to place it. All of that is provided in your specification for this resource. So once you say that, uh, take that combination of custom resource and a controller, you're able to actually create a cluster, and that's exactly what CCP does. CCP is bootstrapped using a single node Kubernetes cluster because CCP runs as a Kubernetes application. It, it then creates a three node uh, control plane on which it installs itself again. Uh, for high availability, it is a multi-node cluster, and it runs as a set of operators within Kubernetes. The first one is the uh, cluster controller, which is in charge of creating one or more uh, tenant clusters. Obviously, if you're looking at a container as a service platform, then you're actually interested in creating more than one most of the times, right? So you create these tenant clusters, and then you say, I want n number of nodes in, in this cluster, I want 10 in another cluster. So there's a node group controller which comes and understands these node types and instantiates them appropriately and manages them as well. There's also an add-on controller which handles the services that we provide, whether it's logging or monitoring. All of these services are uh, managed by the add-on controller. Uh, we're gonna next look at a demo. This is the scenario that we're gonna demonstrate today. We have a, a workload that is running in a CCP tenant cluster. First, we'll show the control plane running as an OpenStack uh, application within uh, CVIM and it will show us creating this demo cluster using CCP and launching an application in that uh, Kubernetes cluster. The application is a WordPress application, but it's going to consume a MySQL service that is going to run on a bare metal, on a VM. Okay. We're gonna show how uh, Elbas is provisioned as well as Cinder volumes are provisioned both from Kubernetes as well as for the VMs. Uh, this is the topology that we're going to demonstrate today. The control plane is running in a 5VM uh, cluster, and it's, it has a dedicated OpenStack <coughs> tenant network. The tenant cluster is also running as a 5VM tenant, uh, tenant cl Kubernetes cluster. 
with one MySQL, there's a separate MySQL uh, instance also attached to the same network as the demo tenant. So with that, we will go to the demo. Right, so, so first we we'll log into uh, CVIM as a user, CCP user, which is uh, who, who has the access to the CCP control plane. We can see that there are five VMs running there attached to the network as we talked about. This is a dedicated <coughs> OpenStack network. And then uh, we take the custom resource that we had shown before, that we talked about before, three masters and two workers, and we do a kubectl apply. So we're basically creating that cluster using CCP. We can then start seeing this uh, object of the type OpenStack cluster appearing within Kubernetes. We can monitor it just as you mon monitor any other Kubernetes object. So you can actually do a kubectl describe OpenStack cluster with the name of the object that you have created, and you can see the status. So it shows you the status of each of the VMs that has been created, the spec with which you have created it, and any other um, resources that it may have created and associated with that cluster as well. So in addition to looking at it from OpenStack, uh, from uh, Kubernetes, we are also going to take a look at how, it, how does it look like from OpenStack. Right? So within OpenStack, you can start uh, you can seeing the VMs get created. So that's one VM right now. We'll slowly start seeing more and more uh, VMs come up within that tenant. There are also a bunch of uh, resources, neutron resources that CCP creates to support this Kubernetes cluster. So we create a network, an internal network, unless if you provide your own network. Uh, we create a router to attach this network to the external network, and we have uh, load balancer created for each cluster. This load balancer uh, provides you access to the Kubernetes API server across the multiple masters because we created a three node, uh, three master cluster, right? So now we can see CCP creating this cluster and while that's happening, we'll go ahead and start up our MySQL VM on which we'll run the MySQL server. And this is a plain VM, there's no Kubernetes involved here. We just has a, at some attached storage, but, but we are going to, put it on the same network as our tenant cluster so that it can directly access the tenant cluster and the services, the Kubernetes services running on the tenant cluster can access this MySQL server. Once the uh, SQL server instance is ready and uh, we'll go back and see that our uh, demo tenant cluster has been created, we can check the status of the VMs now we can see that the MySQL uh, service is still coming up and our, uh, it takes a little time for the cl uh, Kubernetes cluster to start spinning. We can see that the two masters ready and in a minute we'll see all three masters come up at which point we, uh, we are ready to go ahead and start deploying workloads on this master. So we can log into this master or get the cube config for this master and then start deploying the uh, applications there. We can uh, inspect the resources that have been created, the VMs that we have, the volumes that are required to manage persistence for your Kubernetes cluster itself. So the etcd data is stored as a cinder volume. You, you also have uh, MySQL data stored, which is stored as a cinder volume. And as I said, we create that load balancer which front ends all your Kubernetes resource uh, API server requests. We can log into MySQL and check that uh, it's running, up and running. It does not know about WordPress because we haven't deployed that application yet. We can log into the Kubernetes cluster and check that there are no resources, no persistent volumes created, no deployments yet. But there is a storage class that CCP deploys by default. This is one of the add-ons that we have. Right? So you have Cinder. We create a secret to tell our application about how to access the MySQL service. And we refer to the MySQL uh, service using a Kubernetes service, even though it's actually running in a VM, because we want to keep it generic and keep Kubernetes native. So we specify it as a Kubernetes service with an endpoint, which is an IP address, which corresponds to your MySQL IP address. At this point, uh, the application itself can seamlessly refer to my, the MySQL server. 
So let's go ahead and deploy this application. It's created. We've, let's deploy the MySQL service as well so that WordPress can start accessing MySQL. So both of them are created, but not yet ready. So how do we uh, access this application? The way to access it is through the load balancer that it has requested. We can see that an IP is generated. Let's go and see if it's ready. No, it's still starting up. So while it's starting, let's see what are the resources that got provisioned through Kubernetes. So there's a dynamic volume that has been created using Cinder. And there's a load balancer which is created by the OpenStack Cloud provider within uh, Kubernetes. We can see that the WordPress application is able to access uh, MySQL. So we're going to look at the databases and see that now a new database is created. And uh, within a few seconds, the application will be ready as well. So we can actually check that its status is ready and then go back and see if we can now access the application. So once we are able to hit the application, basically, we've uh, been able to connect your application running on a Kubernetes cluster to your uh, MySQL server, which is running on a VM. With that, I'll hand it over to uh, Chandra to summarize. Thank you, Nilipa. Um, So uh, thanks to both Ajay and Ilima. So in summary, um, essentially the CVM platform has continued to evolve to address cus customer needs and, and market trends. Uh, of late, we are obviously seeing uh, a lot of interest in the field uh, to essentially um, um, address or, or, or uh, come through requirements about multiple dimensions of evolutions, uh, which includes both footprint, hardware, networking, storage, workloads. Uh, with that, I am opening it up for questions. Any questions, comments you might have? Thank you. There we go. Um, before we go into Q&A, we do have about three or four minutes left for that. Uh, just wanted to let you know two things. One, we do have demos of the CVIM product in our booth in the marketplace if you want to join us there. Secondly, um, for if you missed anything, and I saw a lot of people taking pictures, Videos of all of the presentations are up on the OpenStack Foundation uh, YouTube channel, usually within 24 hours, if not this evening. So if there's anything you missed, you know, feel free to go to the videos up on the OpenStack uh, Foundation YouTube channel. With that, we've, I've got a mic here. We've got two mics, three mics in the aisle. We can take a couple of questions. Oh, there we go. Uh, I have a small question about the architecture of of the different models you have. Uh, you have a slide with four mo uh, models. I don't see ACI there. So Is there any reason for that? No, so uh, maybe, so ACI is part of CVIM, and ACI, so maybe uh, here. So if we look at uh, networking, we, we already include ACI and VTS as the SDN controller. It's just how much content I can squeeze in here. It's a matter of that. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so to, top of rack can be standalone without ACI, like N, uh, N9K, or it can be a third party, but it, it, we also support the full ACI fabric. In fact, most of my customers who have typically from 50 to 100 nodes, they're all running with ACI. And ACI is also two ways, like you can do ships in the night or you can have neutron plug-in program ACI. So it can be dynamic. And so we have both of them. Let's see. Oh, okay, one more. Um, so as far as I understood, you can install um, CCP on vSphere, right? Yes. But there's no support for NSX right now? No, there is no um, explicit support for NSX right now. And do you plan to do this, or is this a no-go because you have your own solution? We don't have it um, in the near-term plan. Yeah, schedule, okay. Yeah. So no, again, based on customer yeah, requirements. Yeah, exactly. If the customer requirement comes and we have to do NSX, we can do it. Again, one of the things is our philosophy has been, is there, is there a true requirement versus these are all science projects? And we basically prioritize the true requirements. Okay. 
uh, looks like it. Chandra, Nalima, AJ, thank you again.